everyone. I'm Veronica Belmont here with my co-host, Dino Dizovi, and welcome to the Mobile Security Show. With more than 5 billion mobile subscribers around the world and more than half a billion of them accessing the web on their mobile devices, it's a lot for the industry just to keep up with demand. But what about security? Our topic this evening, improving mobility infrastructure security standards. Our panel tonight, Dr. Edward Amoroso, Chief Security Officer at AT&T, Justin Capos, Assistant Professor of Computer Science and Engineering right here at the Polytechnic Institute of New York University, Uma, Sh Uma Chandrasekhar, Vice President of Security, Reliability, and Eco-Environmental Engineering in the Bell Labs at Alcatel-Lucent, and Martin Resch, Founder and Chief Technology Officer at SourceFire. Welcome, everyone. Mobility Infrastructure Standards. Fun stuff. First, what groups dictate these and what role do they play in the development of mobility infrastructure in general? Uma? So in general, when you think about standards and what exactly it is really trying to achieve, it is really to address interoperability mm -hmm. and also to ultimately provide customers, users, the seamless experience, uh, no matter where they are and no matter what they're doing. And also to address global roaming. In addition, you'd want to also make sure that these type of standards are allowing features are able to work no matter what provider, a, a vendor, application content developer, et cetera. So the standards groups that, they're most of the major standards groups that address these are like 3GPP, IETF, ITU, IEEE, those are the global ones. We also have standards that are within each uh, area, with, within the Americas, within Europe and uh, Asia, and those standards also are specific to those areas as well. So how does this affect someone like me, for example? What does this mean to the average consumer, Ed? Well, as Uma pointed out, the primary role of these standards groups is interoperability. So when you get off the airplane in, uh, you know, in Europe, you'd like very much for your phone to work. And if the standards groups are doing their primary role, then that will be the case. Um, I think the problem has been that as in any brand new technology area, unfortunately standards groups tend not to spend a lot of time on security. So for example, if you search the world round for a, a global standard on threat management or vulnerability reporting, uh, you're going to be looking a long time because you're not going to find it. So I think we're kind of at the point where this technology, this mobility technology, this idea that we have ubiquitous internet access in our pocket all the time, um, as that begins to mature, I think kind of the next round of standards discussions and um, uh, and, and group focuses for um, different standards groups is, is going to have to include security. Okay, we'll t definitely touch more on that a right, little bit later. Right. Um, Justin, why, why are, are, are standards so important? So standards are, are very important because uh, if, without them you're going to have an environment like you had sort of in the 1980s where uh, you could be in Germany, you could buy a handset from one carrier and it might not work with another carrier. If you went outside of the country then geez, there's, there's no way the thing would work. And then. Uh, finally, you started to see this sort of amalgamation of st uh, standard bodies happen in local regions where uh, a lot of the, the groups in Europe uh, all came together to form a standards body. You had similar things happen in other parts of the world, and this is kind of how like 3GPP, as you were mentioning, kind of all, all came to be. Um, so it's, it's really critical and important to get these kind of standards in place, and I think there's ways to do this in the right way, and there's ways to, to do this in, in a not so right way. Um, one thing I really like about the way that the IEEE has, has gone and worked with standards is uh, they're very inclusive of outside people like academics coming in and looking at this. Whereas if you look at the way that 3GPP is, is put together, it's basically just a bunch of industry groups and industry professionals there. And so it can be really hard for, for academics or outside hackers to come in and, and say, hey, you know, maybe we need to That's rethink this. And for instance, we might have a repeat of what we saw with like the uh, 802.11 wireless standards that once they're made, then hackers could actually start playing with this and found a lot of issues. Like academic cryptographers sure. found a lot of issues that should have been addressed early on and attackers found other issues. And so we spent the next five to ten years addressing these shortcomings, whereas if um, there was an adversarial viewpoint brought in at the standards process, you might have been able to um, fix some of these problems early on. Uh, Martin, who are these groups and why do people give them credibility? Uh, well, typically they, uh, they're either industry consortiums, as uh, Dustin pointed out, or they are um, groups of, uh, well, with these interoperability standards, they can be groups of uh, uh, vendors as well as uh, even government bodies or, uh, um, you know, uh, back-end back carriers and things like that. 
Um, so it's a uh, variety of different interests that are kind of getting together with this interoperability mission of making sure when I get off the plane in Germany, I can still get my voicemail uh, and uh, you know, and text messages and things like that. Uh, but the security mission is just not something they seem to have really picked up and embraced yet uh, because it's difficult. I'm talking about interoperability standards for security um, in the enterprise where we've had a vested interest even between things like banks where they've got you know quite a bit at stake. Uh, it's just not happening. So you've got that and then we're going to try to turn this into a global exercise where uh, we're going to get um, you know different countries with different privacy standards to talk about security event reporting. I mean it starts to get real hairy real fast. Why do you think that carriers see this as a, as a, as a benefit? What is enticing them to want to improve security standards globally as opposed to just working on what they have on a national level? Ed? Reduce cost, right? I mean, a, a network or a system that is built to some sort of a larger global standard is going to create incentives for vendors to build tools and techniques that they can sell to a broader group, and on and on and on, you play the whole economic thing. But the primary thing is that um, as we start to improve these standards, as carriers, we want to avoid situations uh, like we saw with GSM. Right? With uh, GSM, we have a situation where the standard, perfectly good standard, something that allowed us to move from 1G to 2G services and to begin to experience data on a phone, um, you know, there's no authentication between the handset and the tower. right? And that's something that was certainly blessed by the standards groups. And anybody who's doing computer security would look at that and say, hmm, you know, maybe it'd be a good idea to handshake between the device and the tower which is what we see in 3G networks and obviously in LTE and so on. But it's that kind of thing that you try to avoid. You try to avoid the situation where, as Justin pointed out, you know, perhaps if there was a broader you know, participation at the time, uh, we wouldn't have had that problem. So I think it's a good point. And one thing that we might see is still we've recognized that there's a problem with 2G, that there's no secure handshake. And that yeah. was something at the standard level. Yeah. However, recently, things like OpenBTS have made Making a uh, rogue base station uh, <laughs> much like under a thousand dollars. Open BTS isn't even all that recent, right? Yeah, it's this has been, around, been around for a while, and like yeah. this, co this, the cost of this attack has become yeah. cheaper and cheaper. True. And now people can, you know, set up a rogue uh, GSM base station anywhere if they're willing to break the law, right? If they're willing <laughs> to break the law. Right. All right. So, how much does security factor into the standard set for mobility infrastructure? We'll talk about that next. <laughs> We talked in general about mobility infrastructure standards and the groups that set these, and we touched a little bit on security too. Um, Ed, when it comes to security, do these groups apply the same level of attention and creativity to security as they do to you know, other aspects of infrastructure? People like to talk about crypto, right? I mean, when you do computer security, then you love that topic, and I think a lot of people have spent time debating and discussing uh, different crypto standards, but the computer security problem is much broader. Right, so, um, so I would say that um, it's time now to turn up um, the intensity level around computer security in the standards groups and across the whole sort of mobility ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Good time to start. But I, I think when you look at the, the sheer sort of volume of pages in some of the 802.11, you know, just everything standard, you'll see there's a lot of security stuff in there. It, there is a I, bunch I, in there. You know, but I think when people think about 4G and when they talk about 4G, what they really talk about is they talk about things like you get one gigabit per second at rest or 100 megabits uh, per second in motion. Uh, and there's no real way to say you get uh, a gig of security when you have a non-adversarial tower and 100, you know, 100 megs of security in another environment. So it's a lot harder to kind of quantify this because it's... It's all very based on the, the threat model and who yeah. the attacker is and how things are deployed. And Vulnerability reporting might be some place where we could simplify. Like I think if, um, if you and I were hackers and we found some nasty attack, it's not always clear where you report it, how you report it, what you do, you know, whether there's some automated interface for doing something with that, how the information is protected. Basic questions that right now make you kind of feel like if you're a, like a white hat, I bet you feel yeah. kind of like you're in the Wild West, like and, and invent also, your own also, standard for how to, how to report. There's also a lot of challenges to, to, like as an independent researcher, to be able to play with this equipment without breaking the law. Yeah. Oh, yes. For instance, how can I find vulnerabilities <laughs> in 
you know, yeah. as by, by phone or in the base station so without point. skirting yeah. the law. Isn't that what happened with Karsten Knoll, where he found all these problems with A A5-1 uh, and, and uh, other, you know, A5-2 and other technologies? And right. he had to stop because, well, you know, the law wasn't on his side and he didn't want to cross that line. And a number of countries, like yeah. Germany in particular, are passing, you know, is passing laws that say it's illegal to distribute attack tools and there's a lot of vagaries in whether my research tool can be used for an attack. Yeah. And a lot of researchers are playing on the side of caution and not releasing anything that can be interpreted as an attack tool. Well, find me a security tool that like, isn't dual use. Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Emma, you wanted to jump no, in? No, I was just going to suggest that um, one of the things that at least I've seen, uh, you know, most of the uh, global forums actually are based on using the latest uh, security technologies or protocols and encryption, as, as Ed pointed out. I think as we were talking briefly that a lot of work has taken place now in, in terms of looking at machine to machine, looking at cloud, et cetera. But I think there still needs to be more detailed work specifically on use cases um, that, you know, would, that, are, that are real life situations. We, we really need to focus on, and that, this is where I think private and public partnerships in addition to standards work comes into play. Something that you mentioned also about you know, getting academics, researchers, everybody into, into the game because really it's the experience, it's the lab, it's everything that comes together that drives the, the, this uh, overall holistic view. Martin, do you think we need to go further? Uh, well, I just had a kind of a pie in the sky idea that I thought might be fun to trot out in this panel. Uh, maybe we should have a consumer reporting uh, regulation that requires, so there was this report that came out recently about uh, all the orphaned Android handsets that are out there. So they're released, they never see another software update. The carriers know what they're running. Um, maybe there should be some sort of it's reporting an requirement. Graphic, right? Yeah, yeah. that, that graph was, was really right. was kind of shocking, right? right. Um, but maybe there should be something that, you know, monthly, for example, your carrier sends you a report that lists out and enumerates the vulnerabilities that have been discovered in your phone that are currently unpatched. What right. are, what and then are every reasons? month you get this report, and it's like, geez, this keeps growing. Why isn't my vendor fixing this? Why, isn't they, why aren't they updating the software? Why isn't someone fixing this? The why isn't anyone the fixing this? The users won't know right. who's responsible. Well, why are there, what are the reasons for uh, an OS Maybe to become for <laughs> orphaned? Like, why would a handset manufacturer stop supporting certain versions of their OS for a mobile device? They didn't sell enough. Can sell, but. Yeah, maybe there's something that needs. You know, we need to decide how long must the manufacturer, you know, support the device to be able to sell in the marketplace. But is, is it a hardware limitation? The reason, like, I'm just confused because in these days we can so easily update our our operating systems to the next version. Like with Android, for example, I know there's a lot of fragmentation there. But why would they not be able to continue updating to the latest version? I think on the part of the vendor, it's probably desire more than anything. They want to move away from that version of the... We've got this whizzy new phone, you should just buy a new phone. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, I mean, you're right. I mean, most of the justifications that the folks are offering are business justifications. If you think from a computer science perspective, um, patching is not an acceptable solution. I know it's a necessary evil, right? We have to do it. I think when we watch Microsoft go to auto update, a lot of the um, attack indices that we look at did go down, admittedly. Um, and I think that over-the-air push of patches is, in um, many cases, a necessary evil. But I wonder if we're asking the right question. Like, if we're saying, my gosh, you know, why aren't we pushing all these patches? Why don't we ask the question, why do we need those patches in the first place? Like, what the heck are we doing that um, we just accept as an industry, as a software industry, that it's okay to sell stuff that is broken? And, needs to be patched. I can't think of any other industry like that, right? Where you just knowingly accept that this thing I just paid for is going to have to be constantly updated. So I think what's happened in the industry, and we saw this with um, OS vendors on our PCs. Um, they see some opportunity to move to the next generation hoping that it'll be a more robust OS, give you notification, and then stop patching. That's not a new <laughs> phenomenon. <laughs> so. Uh, so I think across the board, we're just everyone's going to have to come to some acceptable compromise here. Um, and I thought the graphic that was referenced, I think that's a good start, yeah, raising awareness. And one of the most interesting points about that article was that many times, uh, the day that you buy the handset, it has known vulnerabilities in it. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, the yeah. day that the handset's released, there are known vulnerabilities. Not good. Right? Not good. Yeah, yeah, not good. So what can we as users do? Yeah, good luck. I mean, uh, I mean, it's a tough one. Look at that I mean, graph. The answer was buy, buy an iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it really was. It's and a, a tough few one. others, a few other very small set of 
places. Yeah. All right, so what steps should standards group take to improve mobility infrastructure security? And should these standards apply globally? We tackle those tough questions right after the break. First of all, is, uh, we're seeing a reasonable amount of scanning activity on port 53. They have now blocked an entire subdomain. It's possible that someone would be able to remotely install an application on their handset. The iPhone has been pretty good in terms of keeping malware off of it. Android, not so much, and it seems to be picking up speed. This attack is a layer eight. It's the human layer that you're attacking here. Hi. But thanks very much, and uh, look forward to uh, talking with you next time. of a very interesting um, approach to security. Justin, you don't carry a mobile device. No, I do not. And, and how do you do that? You're a very rare animal indeed. <laughs> well, everyone else has one, and I tend to travel with other people, so mm -hmm. all the sorts of things that I need to do, like find a restaurant or not get lost or do other things like that. Um, you put the burden of security on everyone else. Exactly. So you use this as an example of outsourcing the solution. <laughs> yeah, there you I, go. I, outs I outsource it. And you know, for me, I. I uh, I feel slightly uncomfortable with certain private information that might be gathered by uh, companies that, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, would, would be able to gather this information about me if I did have a cell phone. And so for me, it doesn't present an acceptable trade-off, especially now everyone else has one. So. All right. Yeah. I like it. He's off the grid. Okay. Um, so what needs to happen to improve mobility infrastructure security standards? I'll throw it to Martin. Uh, well, for starters, I guess we need to uh, uh, decide uh, what constitutes acceptable security and then uh, start parceling that out to both the, the vendor and service provider community uh, to be able to um, figure out you know, where we need to start finding the intersection of you know, the vendors who are creating the platforms and the software as well as the service providers who are providing the pipes mm -hmm. um, and then uh, getting them to, uh, to talk about solving this problem of security or at least addressing it. I, I don't have any illusions that we're going to solve the problem. I mean, let's face it, we're 40 years down the road with our computing platforms, and uh, I think our scorecard's not looking too good right is now. Is it getting yeah. better, or is it getting worse? Uh, you know, I had my, uh, my mother-in-law corner me in my kitchen a couple of weeks ago and tell me, you've got to stop these guys she was talking about. Uh, <laughs> you personally. You me personally. Stop. Well, uh, I'm the founder of a security company, and uh, so obviously this uh, falls on my shoulders. Uh, to, uh, to do something about all this rampant hacking and theft of IP that's happening right now, uh, largely sponsored by nation states, and uh, you know, you've got to do something about this. So uh, when it's raised to the level of awareness of my 80-year-old uh, mother-in-law that um, <coughs> something needs to be done, uh, then probably our scorecard's not looking so hot. I'd say we're, we're a little worse off than maybe we were 10 years ago. Do you um, sit on any standards groups yourself? Uh, I don't. I, uh, I'm more of a uh, implementer of technology myself. I've implemented a standard or two, um, but uh, no, I, I actually haven't been on a, a mobile standards committee. You know, I have a, a, a thought here. I, I personally think that privacy is the big issue. Um, I think the standards groups and all of us need to decide what we want to do. I want to tell you a funny story. Um, back through the 70s and 80s, phone companies built out infrastructure for detecting and dealing with fraud. And the way we did it, is we would essentially watch on our network to see who you're calling. And let's say you call for the first time some weird country like Albonia. Right? You never called Albonia, it was always a country ending in IA, right? Uh, your first, you called and then boom, you'd get popped into a database. And then if you called Albonia a second time, you'd get underlined in the database. If you called it a third time, you'd get a phone call saying, hey, there's probably toll fraud going on. Because mm. you've never called Albonia, and now you're calling over and over again. And over 20 years, nobody ever, ever once went, you mean you're watching my phone calls? Like we're sending a phone bill, you know? Now, if you did something like that, you'd have people saying, you're monitoring what? You're watching what? Like even when you show a teenager their first phone bill, they say, I'm outraged that you, you keep track of my texts and phone calls. Like, do you keep track of the websites I visit? So I think that sort of opinions around privacy are shifting. And I think as technologists, we need to recognize that and adjust and think of ways that we're going to deal with the problem like fraud is, is something that could easily be uh, addressed in a mobile context using similar algorithms. 
How would you guys feel about something like that? I, I bet well, I know yeah, how Justin, Justin would feel. <laughs> He's off the but, grid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure, but, but, but that needs to be addressed. But, but mobile phones are much, I, I see them as much different than kind of a landline. Mm. Because I see a landline as something that belongs to a location. It belongs to the household. Yeah. It, it wasn't, it, it's not me, it's not my location. Yeah. Right. I don't happen to have a home phone either, but you know, uh, <laughs> if, if I would be more amenable to having a home phone than to have a, a, a mobile phone um, because it, it tracks everywhere I go. It, mm -hmm. it, it has all sorts of personal information, it has my apps, it has all my data. So. Do you use yeah. VoIP? I, I do. Okay, so I that's use... how you're ordering the pizzas. Exactly. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Justin was doing smoke signals out in front of the room. For... <laughs> Martin, do you have an opinion? Uh, well, it's interesting. The privacy thing actually is a really um, key issue right now. I've heard uh, at least uh, kind of apocryphally about uh, one or two divorces that have already happened since uh, mm. iCloud came out and all of a sudden find my iPhone. You were Get where out. doing what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Find has, my uh, friends app. Because of activity on one device mirroring to another? Well, that or I can just ask, what's the location of this? You oh, know, location. Yeah, what, what were you doing? Oh, okay, yeah, the, the Find it. My Friends app will show yeah, you the exactly today. where your house is. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> right. If they opt in. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's an issue. The, the uh, auto cloud syncing is pretty interesting, too. Um, you know, I'm having, um, so my old iPhones get surplus to my children now, so I'm having the apps that they're downloading uh, getting mirrored to my phone now, which is uh, great. My six-year-old uh, spent $99 the other day. I'm seeing a lot uh, of that tonight, for, this for issue. in-app DLC, and I, was, I said, mm -hmm. When it has a little dollar sign in front of it, that's real money you're spending. Ninety-nine yeah. bucks. And it didn't. It didn't. Uh, it didn't ask for approval. I don't even know how that's possible. I, I've been digging into it, but I've been on the road. My 11-year-old <laughs> spent 80 bucks on Stardoll.com buying like some kind of virtual thing. She yeah. didn't realize she was real. It was real money. Well, normally when I'm buying from the app store, you have to punch in your password to to go. But then this is uh, in-app downloadable content, right? So it's buying you <laughs> buying you city bucks for this game, and it's like that's real money. <laughs> my dear. So <laughs> these are, uh, yeah, there's, there's a number of interesting issues uh, happening around this stuff right now. But uh, the privacy question is, uh, I think, going to be paramount um, for uh, the reasons that you point out, as well as for just kind of having the, the integrity of your own, you know, kind of the security of your own, um, you know, whereabouts. You know, getting asked for papers, please, when you hit a police checkpoint mm -hmm. is bad yeah. enough, but it's now it's like, yeah. Why were you in the same building with this dissident that we've been tracking? Uh, right. You know, are you in the same building with a guy who's uh, doing WikiLeaks? Well, you know, we're going to add you to a watch list. That sort of thing. That gets real, real bad in a big hurry. So we've got to figure that out. But you know, the privacy thing has been around for you know quite a while. I, I agree with you, Ed. I mean, that we're just becoming more sensitive to that information. I mean, think about. You know, when you're driving and you go through Easy Pass or Easy Toll, if you don't pay the toll, there's a picture taken of you, mm -hmm. of, of your car, the oh, license plate number, and it goes back and it's sent to your home. I've heard of cases just like you talked about, that, that, that particular case where someone else was in the car that wasn't supposed to be in the car, <laughs> and that picture went home. So that, that is actually, you know, a, a privacy issue as well. So I, I think we uh, definitely need to look at it in much more uh, holistic way. I mean, Europe and other parts of of the world are actually, you know, much more rigorous with looking at privacy. We are at, in different parts of, of the country, but I, I believe that it, the challenge is, you know, how do you give, get, get the features and the, oper uh, the things that you want to do at the same time to respect the pe person's uh, individual yeah. profile and Yeah, and I think we could definitely have a whole panel on that kind of discussion. I think so, <laughs> absolutely. And Martin brought up a good point about, like, just, you know, privacy, and one of the things we're noticing with a lot of the, uh, the spread of technology is a lot of the attacks are becoming democratized. For instance, one of my friends who's a security researcher really freaked out another friend by calling him or texting him once his plane landed and said, you just took Air Japan flight into this and you just landed in JFK. And he was able to ascertain all this information by, you know, because he had his, his phone number and was able to monitor his movement. <laughs> and these things have been you know, recently fixed, but it's, um, you know, jarring a little bit to think about this. Well, it's, it's even scarier than that because, you know, some research that actually went on by our department had Keith Ross, they found that they could track users over Skype. Even if you block a user over Skype, they could go and track your IP address. So they could say, you're on vacation here, you're, you're doing this, you're doing that. So it's uh, yeah, yeah, scary threats stuff. in the real I mean, and, system. I mean, but just to go back to this point about uh, the, the, the enrichment of features. So just to me, I was talking to a friend another the other day, and they, were, they have a BMW. They they were at a point where the uh, the the uh, service time came up, and the the car called 
the the service center automatically and said, you know, it's up for service. Where before she even knew about it, yeah. and so she <laughs> then was shocked. I mean, it was a pleasant surprise, but the fact that that information was shared, you know, it basically shows that you know there's a lot more things of where you went. What could I mean? There's so much that can be done with that information. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. It seems that that people are upset about privacy until it really enriches their life in some way. Then they're like, oh, that makes sense. But I wanted to bring it back to standards a little bit. Should companies be deviating from standards? You think in, in order to improve security in their infrastructure? Well, you can't deviate from interoperability standards, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the way most mobility networks are built today is that there's this canonical template, vendors build to the template, and even if you wanted to deviate, you know, if you're building a radio access infrastructure, for example, um, you have to buy what's on the market, and the market is gonna have standards-based equipment. So I'm not sure that it's so much deviating as extending. Like, for example, when an attack becomes known, a lot of times carriers will say, okay, um, I'd like to be able to detect whether this attack is possible on my network, um, the standards don't account for this. So what you do is you build out your own stuff. You know, you rig your interfaces and you pull data and you say, do I see this attack? And when you do that, you're designing, you're building something that's non-standard. And I think it's a symptom of the fact that most of the standards groups, even though you're right, there's tons of security stuff in there, it's not coordinated around a lot of the problems that occur day to day. Well, what about open standards? Yeah, they can be open. Again, I don't think there's any big secret about you know, somebody wanting to know, I mean, it's a perfectly reasonable question. You go to Black Hat, here's an attack. And then you say, hey, would that attack work on our network, followed by silence in the room? <laughs> you know, and you say, okay, so how can we figure that out? And that's usually followed by some invention that has to occur. We need to try this, need to try that. And it's unfortunate because um, those things could easily be standardized across the infrastructure. So, uh, I mean, just to go back to that question, ultimately, it's really the business requirements. I mean, the users will ultimately drive where, where standards need to go to. Mm -hmm. And uh, each operator and uh, you know, vendor will, will determine based on their own business requirements what makes best sense. Uh, but the, I think the most important thing about this whole area of deviating is then we go back to the initial premise that interoperability will not be there. And, I mean, mm -hmm. so therefore, interworking between vendors, um, being able to, uh, you know, land in Japan and or, or be able to call somebody in Australia and not worry about, you know, will the call go through or would my transaction take place? That's that's a challenge. So it's a challenge between the two. Mm -hmm. Martin, as a vendor, you obviously have a very specific perspective on this one. What do you think? Uh, yeah. Well, we see people extend their, uh, you know, beyond the standards of their. Uh, um, you know, that they're kind of uh, driven to. And what we see with these implementations uh, over and over again, this happens in the enterprise as much as it happens in mobile carrier networks, is the make it work, oh, now we got security problems, let's fix those <laughs> mentality. And this is, you know, this has been around for as long as computers have been around. Hey, let's make this stuff work. You know, today I just want to make computer A talk to computer B if I get nothing else done. And once that's done, you know, let's go have a beer and tomorrow, We'll sort out, you know, getting everything nice, and then three weeks later, it's like, ooh, boy, bad guys have been pounding on this thing. We got to do something about that now. So taking that and getting beyond your standards implementation and doing something that's going to be effective to solve the the day-to-day -day problems that you actually have. And these standards don't really talk about the day-to-day -day problems that people are going to run into. So you have to uh, be prepared to act beyond the standards uh, in order to secure yourself these days. And Martin, you actually bring up a good point. In order, in order to make things just work, a lot of times devices will downgrade to an earlier version of the standard so that for interoperability, and these mm. earlier versions of the standards may not have all the security features. For instance, 2G, 2G may not have all the security features that 3G has, mm. but the devices will still automatically downgrade. And we saw that at uh, Black Hat with a rogue uh, tower uh, exactly. at Black Hat this year. Somebody set up a rogue tower that had enough power to get people to downgrade to 2G, and then uh, they started dropping rootkits on Android phones. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Justin, any thoughts? Yes. Um, I, I think that if you're in an environment where vendors are tempted to go beyond the standards, uh, this is maybe a situation where you sort of over-standardize. So if you think uh, a little bit about just the security of systems in general, you typically have this policy mechanism separation. And what uh, these vendors often want to do is they want to change the, the policies, not the mechanism, to make things work better for them. And so um, I, I think where a lot of this tension comes from is that uh, too much of the policy ends up 
down in the standards. Too many things of, of that nature does, and so people are not able to innovate well enough on top of this. All right, some great points by our panelists. Uh, when we come back, it's the audience's turn to ask the questions, so get them ready. my questions on improving mobility infrastructure security standards, but now let's see how they do with our audience. If you have a question, just raise your hand. We've got one right here. Yeah, so you've talked a couple of times on uh, how GSM is very insecure. It has been demonstrated that you can literally listen to phone calls and read text messages. And also we know that like the phone, whenever it sees a better signal, GSM will go down to GSM. In parallel, many phones, at least iPhones for sure, they have an option that you can turn off your 3G connection. So you save money, you don't use that much mm -hmm. data. Don't you think that it would be interesting, maybe from a security perspective, to have the same option but to deactivate uh, GSM? It should be sort of easy to do because there's an AT command that like, allows you to turn off the GSM uh, modem. Is turning off GSM the answer? I mean, I don't disagree. That work it just you, you, uh, your user experience might degrade, right? So if you wander into an area where there's no uh, 3G capability, then the fallback goes away, right? So I agree. I think for someone who is focused on privacy issue, believes that there is um, a paramount concern in that area, and probably be inclined to do that. I think it would be my guess, and I don't have a good study to share with you, um, I probably should, but I suspect that the vast majority of folks when presented with that option would probably say, well, I'd like to keep the 2G so I can continue my connectivity. But you're right, um, I think you, you raise a valid point. Um, Avoiding the GSM uh, protocol is uh, avoids the problem, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a downside. Right? Uh, Uma, what do you think? I mean, I really uh, think that ultimately you want to get to, you know, improving where we are with respect to it. So instead moving of to the to next. Fall back. Yes, and instead of having to fall back. And obviously today you can just, you know, use the Wi-Fi or whatever and turn it off. Uh, but I, I would say it's better to just move ahead and, and not you know, focus, because you're actually limiting your capability <laughs> by turning it off. And, that, and I think um, you know, ultimately that's not what we want to do. I think what it might take is actually enough users complaining about the problem. If you look back at the international data charges that a lot of people were getting on their iPhones you know, when they first came out, a lot of people complained about having high charges that were unexpected. It, and then the option was added to disable international data roaming. So if a lot of users are complaining right. about their yeah. privacy concerns for using 2G networks, um, then the change will be made. But it requires user uh, spreading awareness among users as well. I agree. Mm -hmm. Any other perspectives? No? All, all right, we'll take another question then. <laughs> Zero G. <laughs> another one right down here in front. Hi. So there's an initiative from a standards organization called Global Platform to create a trusted execution environment on the phone. But it seems like there has to be a lot of business incentive to do this because a bank has to agree to run on a trusted operating system which has to run on specialized hardware, which has to run on a device from an OEM, which has to run on a carrier. And it seems like there's at like six or seven companies that have to agree, uh, and I just want your opinion on how, how do we make this work, where the standards exist and the technology exists, but it's a business problem now. We need that financial incentive, uh, Martin. Um, well, to some degree, um, it, it is that, but building a secure execution environment, an actual hardware level secure execution environment on today's platforms is still very challenging. Uh, we do have some companies um, such as Apple that are building their walled garden that have very controlled access and things like that. But if you want to have a general purpose computing architecture that is you know, a trusted secure platform, uh, you're going to get into some significant issues about um, control of that environment, who controls that environment, who dictates what software can and cannot run in that environment, as well as who controls uh, where the data goes about how that device is being used. Um, so there's a lot of questions that will have to be answered around that. I think it is a business problem. Is there any demand for this? Because it's going to take a lot of uh, mental horsepower to figure out the relationships and engineering horsepower to make it all work. But if we could get a secure execution platform, hardware-wise, in the first place, then building all the other stuff uh, to make it work, 
is there enough demand to make it worth it from a, from a cost perspective to the vendors, to the carriers, and things like that? Um, so it's a, it's a good question. There's been some interesting uh, science fiction written around these sorts of concepts, uh, actually. Um, no, not always science fiction. I mean, once upon a time, um, there was a group that invented a concept called the Trusted Computing Base, and they built a standard called the Orange Book and tried to get everybody, you know, hepped up around this idea of, you know, um, safe execution in a trusted hardware software combined environment. And after about 10 years of trying, everybody gave up. <laughs> so I don't know that that's the right answer. But I think it underscores the point that it is very hard to do. And now with all the emphasis around dual persona, multiple persona, a, a device to bring to work that you know you hit this button in your home mode, hit that button, you're in work mode, you know begs the question: How do we build trusted, um, you know, operating systems and trusted environments? And important area of research, no trusted, question. Yeah. Trusted operating systems are actually a very interesting thing yeah. because they were a lot of work to administer. And in the end, they were still software and could be hacked. Yeah. For instance, uh, Argus, the company way back in the, a while ago, made a trusted operating system. Mm -hmm. And as a demonstration, a, a Polish hacking group called the Last Stage of Delirium walked up at a conference and hacked their trusted operating system from the keyboard. <laughs> and um, it was very eye-opening at the time. Yeah. Marketing people love that, right? Yeah, because <laughs> the, to them, it looked like the sky was falling. <laughs> Justin, you wanted to say something? Yeah, and I, I think um, the jury's still a little bit out in the academic community about uh, TPM. And uh, I, I think that's part of, of what you're referring to in, in your question, um, having this, this trusted hardware in place that's going to validate something like an operating system. Well, typically the way that these things work is they go and, and you have something like an OS binary. And really what the TPM is telling you, it's not telling you that your OS is trusted, it's telling you that I actually loaded this OS. And so uh, I, I think that when we look at sandboxes and things that have been constructed, the temptation has always been to cram a lot of code into there. So if you, if you look at like the trusted code in Java, there's you know, a, on the order of a million lines of code when you start to look at standard libraries and other things where a bug could creep in and let an attacker do evil things. So I think until we get a better kind of end-to-end -end story that really addresses all these questions, I'm, I'm not sure that, that it's just a matter of a business problem to solve, and then the world will be a perfect place. All right. Let's take another question from the audience. We've got one in the front. Oh, we'll go back there. Okay. <laughs> uh, Ed mentioned earlier that you build a secure system by taking things out of it rather than adding things to it, by simplifying it. And I spent a couple of years, long time back, uh, helping design a very widely used standard. And what I had observed at that time is that these standards are created by committees, and everybody attending likes to contribute to it because they can go and tell their boss. They look good <laughs> to their boss when they do that. And sometimes there are business con considerations also in, in getting things in. And then what happens as a result is that the one that I was involved in, this, the standard got pretty bulky, and uh, things were there in it that need not have been there. I was wondering if the same thing happens with these communication standards, and if so, aren't they really doomed as far as security goes? Too many cooks in the kitchen in the, in the standards I'd, groups? I have a comment. I think any time you have human beings, you have that pheno the kitchen sink phenomenon. There's no question about that. But the balancing concern is that a lot of vendors tend to participate in these standards. And vendors have a, uh, a generally a vested financial interest in the standards being tilted in a manner that's consistent with the technology they build. <laughs> so you know whether they're putting something in or out, a lot of times they like to go back to the boss and say, "Hey, listen, I tilted the standard in a way that's consistent with this thing that we sell. That's what I see more than throwing things in. But I think you're right. Human beings definitely want to contribute. And I don't think there's ever, has there ever been a novel that was a bestseller written by committee? I don't, I don't think so. Um, it generally don't work out too well. So standards, unfortunately, read like committee works. Right? It's a great point. So, no, but I, I, would, I would say that standards are really a toolkit uh, to help you understand what needs to get done in terms of, so in order to be, for it to be interoperable. And it, it really isn't meant to tell you, you know, how to get it done. It's really meant to tell you what needs to get done. And, 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 and every vendor or operator and, and can build it to, as long as it meets the intent of what we're trying to achieve so that we can achieve interoperability. And that's really what standards are really intended to do. 
And I have to counter you, there actually is an online crowdsourced novel being written by Neil Stevenson. I said so we're bestseller. Not, we're not sure yet <laughs> if it will be, but we'll find Maybe out, I guess. Will. Time will yeah. tell. All right, should we have another question right here in the front? Thanks. Uh, so the context of the conversation that you guys have had today is mostly around mobile phones, like the one that I have in my pocket. However, as more devices come online, less of them are actually phones, and more of them are things that I wouldn't even think of as a mobile device, like my refrigerator, my car, or my alarm system. What are some of the security issues with those, and what is anyone doing about them? Open so, question. Okay. So actually, this brings up some topical research. Um, we mentioned earlier that your cars are now often on the cellular network. And so you have things like OnStar and all these things basically allow remote car starting. Well, if they're on the cell network, they're vulnerable to attacks as well. And there's been some recent research that has demonstrated how to um, first you know, start a car remotely over the cell network. Mm -hmm. And two, there's also been some research on actually taking, embedding malware into the car over the cell network. And this gets scarier and scarier as we think about how these devices that are very crucial to our lives, and not only crucial to our lives, they control our lives. Like if our car crashes, we die. And these are on the same networks as our phone. Yeah, there's, uh, there was a really interesting uh, article that came out recently. Well, first off, how many microprocessors are there in the typical car these days? I mean, there's a lot. Yeah. So do you want the, uh, the thing that allows the car engine to be started? How separate is that from the brake control computer, for example, you right. know, that turns on and off the anti-lock brakes or, or the uh, stability control and things like that? There was a really interesting article about a guy who was doing a, a pen test on uh, in-flight entertainment systems uh, that uh, uh, figured out that he could get access to the uh, engine control computers uh, from yep. the in-flight entertainment system. And the, uh, the guy who sponsored the test said, uh, oh, that's out of scope. Don't worry about that. Right. <laughs> right. We're not Comforting. paying you to look at that. That's right. one to test in the hangar, not at 30,000 yeah. feet. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You know, one thing at at t we have some pretty cool research going on. Some of the folks sitting right in the front row um, looking at records, look at call detail records and trying to determine, is it a human or is it a machine? Mm -hmm. And just from sort of metadata, it's interesting that you can kind of start to see the difference. I mean, um, these m to m systems apparently look very much like um, mobile sensor networks, and there may be something useful there. It's not clear, but a lot of R&D going on in that area. All right, well, we have time for one more question. I'll get this one in the front. Thank you. So there is a lot of discussion going on about offloading of data from cellular, phone, uh, cellular networks to Wi-Fi networks. And there's been newer standards like 802.11u from IEEE where they're trying to set up wireless networks, Wi-Fi, in a way so that it's more similar to cellular so users don't have to worry about putting a password every time an access point changes and stuff like that. Uh, don't you think there are uh, significant security implications when we start to offload to Wi-Fi? Because now we have unlicensed spectrum versus licensed spectrum, which means I don't need to have an expensive BTS anymore, fake BTS anymore, but I can have mm -hmm. an access point, a fake access point, which I can do with a Linux box that costs 100 bucks. I think with the decreasing cost of creating an access, of creating like a, you know, using open BTS and creating an access point, that means that we have to pay more attention to the security of, you know, the cell protocols, just like we've had to with 802.11. And in the, in the end, that's a good thing, that basically we are relying on the security of the design rather than the, expen you know, the expense of the equipment. Because as we know about technology, technology always becomes cheaper over time. Any other thoughts from the panel? All right. Well, thank you so much for the great questions, everyone. Um, we're going to wrap it up with our final thoughts, about maybe one minute each. Let's start with Martin. Um, so final thoughts on security standards. I think uh, this has been a really interesting uh, panel to uh, talk about these within. Um, I think that you know some of these fundamental questions, we have all the interoperability standards that are out there. And if we're going to start talking about security, uh, much as we've spoken about over the course of this panel, um, we're going to need to start addressing some of the core concerns, such as privacy, which is what the users are really going to be interested in from the get-go. Yes, I want security, but I want to be really careful with my privacy. In the age of Facebook and all the privacy concerns that Facebook brings to the table for individuals, when we know we have these devices that are capable of tracking our whereabouts and tracking what we're doing and what we're seeing and who we're talking to, um, this privacy question uh, becomes paramount in the user's mind. Um, and then once you can answer those questions, then getting into the actual mechanics of doing things like security, threat management, uh, security reporting, uh, maybe my, my crazy idea about uh, giving people their consumer reports monthly about uh, how, how bad you're doing uh, from a uh, protection standpoint, those sorts of things. I think we have to 
answer some of these fundamental questions and decide what's important to us too uh, from a security standpoint. Um, and once we do that, we can start heading down the road of creating security standards. Great, Uma? So when you think of, um, I mean, from standards in general, as I mean, we've talked about, we really are focused on interoperability. However, when you look at a security solution, what are we really trying to do? We're literally looking at attacks that are in process and being able to put something in place to build resilience so that you can, because you're not going to be able to stop the threats, but what you are going to be able to do is make sure that you can at least mitigate them and address them and build the right resilience earlier in the process. And that's what standards are and should be trying to do it more and more of. The other piece is also to be more preventive and more proactive earlier and later on in, in the process so that whether it's people, process, or, or technology, ultimately it all has to come together and be a holistic approach looking at it from a security by design approach. My mobile device free friend, Justin. <laughs> well, I, I, I'd like to touch on kind of two points here in closing. Um, first of all, I, I think that having a good separation of, of mechanism and policy uh, would be tremendously helpful for the community going forward because I think you'd see a lot fewer vendors that try to go and deviate from standards. Uh, and, and furthermore, uh, you know, the point I touched on earlier, I, I think it's important to get other perspectives in the room. Mm -hmm. And I think um, you know, having a, a forum by which researchers can go and participate. We have, here we have something called YCAT, which is actually one of the biggest NSF-funded centers. I, I think they're the, the biggest center that does uh, wireless <laughs> research. And so we're, we're kind of on the cutting edge, but we're really held back. From, from talking to people. We've had research that's kind of gone tangentially into, into things that have been done, but we kind of don't have a seat at the table. So, so help us help you. Ed, what do you think? Awesome points, I agree with them all. Not, not really much more to add. Uh, standards are important, and especially in the security area. Need to reinvigorate. And our security expert, Dino, of course. The best thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> and what I want is to make sure that you know, our mobile devices always choose the most secure standard and can't be, won't automatically or be forced right. to use an insecure standard. All right. Well, thank you so much to our great panelists here tonight, Ed, Uma, Martin, and Justin, and of course, Dino. And special thanks to our terrific hosts here at the Polytechnic Institute of New York University, and of course, our fabulous audience. I'm Veronica Belmont with Dino Daizovi, and we'll see you next time on another edition of Mobile Security Show.